Hey guys, this is Hannah. And I'm Amber. And we're That's Not Good, a true crime podcast. Where we talk about everything from true crime, to paranormal, to ghost stories, to weirdness. And we're kind of funny too. We sure are. Find us on our socials at That's Not Good, a true crime podcast. And wherever you listen to podcasts. Just do it. See you there. Bye. Bye. The subject of this series may just be the worst atrocity the world has ever seen that you've never heard of. Going back to just before the beginning of World War II, to a war that you also probably have never heard of, we're going to discuss in great detail the events of what many call the Six Weeks of Horror, containing everything from shootings to crucifixions, castrations to being buried alive, and an absolutely massive amount of sexual assault and all-out murder, where neither men, women, or children from fetuses all the way up to the elderly, no one was safe in this city from the invading army. We're going to dig deep to tell you what happened, why it happened, who tried to stop it, and what happened to those that participated in it. Spoilers, not much. Today, we give you episode one of The Rape of Nan King. <laughs> I'm Kevin Young. And I'm Don Harrigan. And this is Torture. Boy, is it ever. <laughs> it's, this, okay, it's not going to, I'm just, for if, if you're out there and you, you don't know the rape of Nan King, which I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect a lot of people to know about the rape of Nan King. It's not something that's really taught over here anyway i don't know about about in europe um the first i heard of it was when you mentioned it to me yeah the japanese have so. the japanese and to uh, a lesser extent but still an extent <clears throat> the uh, american and european governments have done a, quite a bit to squash down the retelling of this story uh because of how everybody kind of plays in it we'll get more into how uh, Europe and America play into it later episode, not so much today. Um, probably next episode, I'll tell a little bit, I'll tell uh, kind of the history of um, how everything came to be. So you'll hear more about that then. Um, okay. But there's a reason that you have, you probably have never heard of the rape of Nan King. Uh, the Japanese worked really hard to make sure nobody heard about the rape of Nan King because it gets fucking brutal. Uh, just so you well, know, considering, considering we know so much about the Holocaust, for example. Yeah. To then know yeah. then that we don't know much about this because of how bad it was, that it was kind of hidden. Right. That kind of already says a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, with things like, obviously, now I say it's the worst atrocity the world has ever seen that you've never heard of. Um, what happens in Nanking and from Shanghai leading up to Nanking? So it's a it, it, that's a few months, but mostly in and around Nanking, the, the majority of it takes place in about six weeks, compared to the Holocaust or. Um, you know, the slave trade or uh, the horrible things that, you know, Americans did to the Native Americans back, you know, when we were taking over their country. Uh, those Wasn't took that long, though. Yeah, those took years to, to work up. We're going to be talking about literally hundreds of thousands of deaths within six weeks. So that's pretty heavy. More more people will die in Nanking from what the Japanese do to the Chinese people than 
the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki put together. Really? Yes. Jesus. And they did it with guns and bayonets oh. and swords and a bunch of other uh, inventive stuff that we'll get to in a little bit. Uh most of the stuff we're going to talk about on this episode is going to be pretty just like straightforward mass, you know, mass murder and torture. Uh, nothing that people of this that listen to this show aren't used to already. The next show will have yeah. quite the trigger warning with it because that's when we'll get into the uh, the the mass rapes, and those are going to be hard for some people to hear. So I'll have like timestamps and stuff so people can jump around and not have to hear the horribleness of it uh dan you have no choice <laughs> oh yeah yeah I'm so, where's that mute button <laughs> I, I just sit here nodding kind of going, yeah okay yeah yeah i hear you <laughs> yeah it's gonna yeah the second episode is gonna be the third episode won't be as bad it, 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 it'll be the easier one but um you know there's that say, <laughs> say third third episode we uh Two of us just sit here and play Uno to kind of break all the tension. <laughs> we'll just tell, yeah, we'll just tell you. Uh, yeah. We'll just send everybody fun pictures of baby animals. Uh, the uh, yeah, the third episode won't be as bad, but you know, there's that saying that well, the worst is over now. Um, for these next two episodes, uh, the worst won't be over. Everything I tell you <laughs> will be the best it's going to get because the next thing's going to be worse. It's over and over, and over and over and over again. It reminds me of a, uh, I watched this like medical TV shows, people who had like surgeries and stuff and things were fucked up and it ruined their lives and all this shit. It was a long time ago. And this guy had some surgery done and the doctor accidentally left like a sponge inside of him and they yeah. didn't realize it. And all of his tissue kind of like grew around it and there's nothing they could do. They couldn't take it out without killing him. And they told him, Every day of your life is going to be the best day of your life because the next one is going to be worse than the one before. So this is going nice. to be the best day of your life. The next day, it's going to be as good as it gets. Next day, that's going to be as good as it gets from now on. That's kind of what these two episodes are going to be like. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. So you have been warned. Um, But before we get going, as the norm, call the action. This time, you know, just... Tell somebody about the show. Just go out and word of mouth. Just tell somebody about the show. Just if, if you know, you know somebody likes uh, true crime or macabre or weird history or you know horror movies or whatever. Seems like this would be something they'd be into. Tell them about it. Say, hey, you might like this. Check it out. The worst that can happen is they listen to it, don't like it, think you're fucked up for listening to it, and then never talk to you again. And then hey, less Christmas yeah. presents you have to buy. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. I was thinking this, and like, hey, friend who has a fucked up sense of humor. Yeah. That's we all know that person. Oh yeah, you might be that person. Well, we are in that you know instance. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. If, just tell somebody. You know, um, we we're gonna we have a QR code. I plan on throwing up on the uh, the Instagram, Twitter, and all that stuff, and you know, you know, show that to people. They can scan it or whatever, and it'll take them uh, straight to the show. So, anyway, Ooh. we got some stuff to cover today. So, uh, Dan, how have you been? Uh, good. Good. Can't complain too much. Yeah. You know, same old, same, same old. Same old, same old. Kind of want to get more done than I have been getting done, but I've been very lazy the last two weeks, which is a good thing. I have two weeks off, so I'm like, yeah, do nothing. Yeah, I have a to-do list sitting here, yeah. and not a single item has been marked off. <laughs> so, I'll do some stuff tomorrow. But, um... Ah, uh, famous last words. Yeah. I'll do yeah, some stuff well, tomorrow. <laughs> But the thing is, and I'd say you probably know how uh, how happy this makes me. But as you know, I'm like a bit of a guitar pedal nerd yep. and all that. And I got the last pedal I needed for a particular collection. Oh, is that the week, one that so you posted uh, in the box? It's one of them. Yeah. Okay. One of them. Yeah. Okay. Go follow uh, so, Dan's uh, Instagram. What's all the fuzz about? And you get to see all of his toys fucking yeah toys the non-kinky ones <laughs> that's a different instagram account well yeah, well, was, yeah <laughs> different different kind of fuzz um but yeah that's that's about it with me how about you i'm all right you know nothing new um yeah. wife and i are still reeling from the uh the news of justin Rowland. i have the plumbus still out here 
Um, but we're reeling from the uh, the news that Justin Rowland won't be on Rick and Morty anymore. And uh, who, who does? What does he do for he you? Cre- he he exactly. he uh, he's creator of the show. He plays Rick and oh, Morty. Oh, the main. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I never look at credits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. He's never... yeah. He's uh, he's the main guy behind behind Rick and Morty. Uh, he's not gonna be a part of it anymore. It's, I mean. What like how? They're gonna recast the uh, <laughs> and then it's gonna it's fall down it, massively. Good chance. And then they'll yeah. It's a good then he'll chance. go and he'll do something else called well, like so making making Rorty or something. Like, <laughs> well, Hulu yeah, cut yeah. ties with him too. Um, I don't know how much of it you know. He was um, he's been accused of domestic assault, federal domestic assault, because apparently uh, he had. This is all accusations that hasn't been proven in court or anything like that i believe you know when a woman says that she was a uh, uh, you know abused especially when we're getting ready to cover what we're getting ready to cover uh, a woman says she was uh, abused uh you gotta you know you believe her and a woman i don't know if it was a girlfriend or somebody who's just dating says that uh he held her captive in his house would not let her leave um assaulted her a whole bunch of stuff so if all that's true then you know get rid of them good riddance don't need that mm-hmm. type of shit um, yeah, yeah, you know, as a fan, you kind of crush fingers and hope that maybe it's not true. But at the end of the day, y- you believe women when they say that they were assaulted. And she says that what she went through is it, it sounds pretty horrifying. So uh, also believe men when they say they've been to. Just yes, if men have been assaulted, ble- when anybody says they've been assaulted, believe them. Yeah. <laughs> because most yeah, people. Contrary to what a lot of, you know, certain people would like to say, uh, most people aren't going to come forward and say that they were assaulted by somebody if they actually weren't. I mean, it just doesn't usually happen well, that way. Yeah, I was going to say, especially a man. You know, I mean, if it's a thing just like an awful lot of that, ooh, can't say anything. I'm a man. Yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. Say it. Yeah. Probably was, like, say it. Yeah. The same. If you're in trouble. And- Get help. Kevin does it to me on a fortnightly basis. <laughs> <laughs> In my he assaults my ears. It's gonna be bad this time too. In my brain. <laughs> All right. That's why I brought water with me this time. Oh, instead of liquor. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm all like, actually, no, I'm not. Not bought whiskey. I will have a whiskey later, maybe. Okay. Yeah. All right, so our main source for this series is The Rape of Nan King, The Forgotten Holocaust of World War II by Iris Chang. Now, Iris Chang is actually the granddaughter of survivors of The Rape of Nan King. Now, her grandparents actually got out a little bit before the shit really hit the fan, um, kind of when during the aerial bombardments. She interviews a ton of people who survived. Uh right including her her parents who were very little at the time her grandparents um I, somebody will we will meet in the next episode she interviewed who that woman might be my new hero but again you have to wait and by the end of the series uh we will talk about iris a little bit and how some people mostly japanese nationalists uh would like to see her done away with because well Japanese nationalists that's, are kind of like the Holocaust deniers. They, they want to say it didn't ever happen. When I, I don't want to go interrupt the flow here, but remind me asking you, this woman who you said you might might be your hero, yeah. does she speak Latin by chance? No. No, she's a Japanese. She's a Chinese woman. Well, under, on the, on the, the Gilda Ray standard, she can't be, uh, or Gilda Ray, whatever the hell his name is. She cannot be a hero. <laughs> no. <laughs> I see what you're Just doing. I see where you're yeah, coming. We, from. we have I have a hero graph now, <laughs> right? And <laughs> speaking Latin is, it, is the basis. Of <laughs> if you don't speak Latin, you don't even get on the chart. No, exactly. No, so you have to start off with Latin, and then oh fuck, the trajectory goes from there. All right. Anyway, sorry, my apologies. That's fine. Yeah, not, yeah, Japanese nationalists. I, I suppose that that probably comes from like the. Geez, I don't know what way to put it. Like you know the way things were in japan back in like even like was it back like 60 70 years ago you know it yeah. was kind of i want to say regimental or so you know like yeah. it, it's 
Yeah, there's you a know what I'm trying to say. There's a there, there's like a national pride of we did nothing wrong. Um, but mm. there's evidence. Specifically, the Japanese actually wrote about it in the newspapers and broadcast it across the nation about the things that were happening right. and how proud they were of it. Um, there is a culture in the military that is kind of force fed into the troops from the higher ups to, uh, you know, pretty much hate all other Asians, that you are the strongest. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, the land of the samurai. This is where you're coming from. Yeah, Everything's yeah. about honor and knowing what these men did. Uh, in these, you know, six weeks, uh, is pretty dishonorable. So, but let's get into it. So, near the end of July 1937, with the invasion of Shanghai, the Second Sino-Japanese War was in full gear. Let's give a little bit of history, context, context, so we're all on the same page what's going on before we get to the true horror of the story. So the Second Sino-Japanese War was, in essence, an attempt to take over the Chinese nation by the Japanese. That's pretty much all it was. But obviously mm-hmm. there's more to it than that, which we will get to in the next episode. But that's all you need to know now. The Japanese were invading the Chinese because they wanted the land. Um, first Sino-Japanese War was pretty much a battle between the two for the Korean Peninsula. And Japan actually won the majority of that one. All right. Hmm. So, starting about two full years before the invasion of Poland by Germany, it's, in my opinion, that if it had not been for the full blow-up of World War II and the eventual bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a good portion of China would be Japanese territories to this day. I never heard of either Sino-Japanese War, and I was a history buff. In school, yeah, yeah. Um, so to learn about I this, never heard of them either, yeah, so. to learn about this was kind of like well, I didn't fucking know any of this shit. <laughs> um, it wasn't say it was a full blown war. Uh, it was more a series of battles. Um, they call it a war, but if it had been a war, then a lot like a lot of other countries would have came to the aid of China. So it wasn't technically a war, but. So it's kind of similar to, I want to say, kind of what's happening at the moment, maybe, with Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, like an, it was not it, an a occupation. It's not war, but they're, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. they're battling each other kind of thing, but nobody else is fully involved. Yeah, pretty much every, you know, it, it's, it's just like pretty much everything that America has done since Vietnam. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a war, it's, a, you know, a conflict. Yeah. Well, but they, everything America has done since Vietnam has been for freedom, though. Yeah, hasn't it? Yeah, because freedom isn't free. It costs yeah people like you and me. Yeah. Yeah. Costs a buck a five. <laughs> freedom costs the buck a five. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, the the war, quote unquote, didn't all start real th- the invasion of Shanghai, but that is what most people look at when they say, "Well, when did when when did the the war you know begin?" Most people would look at the invasion of Shanghai, the invasion. It's far from a cakewalk. Now, the Chinese outnumber the Japanese about 10 to 1. If if you don't know, there's a lot of Chinese people. They're, like, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially in China. Yeah. There's a lot of them. <laughs> Even back then, there was a lot of Chinese people. Uh, yeah, sure, the, the thing would have been a full swing, then, wouldn't it? The, or was it even at that stage? I don't know, do I have the, the law about how many kids you could have? Uh, you I don't, I one, don't one think... Parent, one child family thing? I don't know if that was a law in the mid-30s, mid to late 30s or well, not. Let's find out. Let's find out. China, one child law dates. Um, policy dates. Um, it was introduced in 1980. Okay. And ended oh. in 2016, so there you go. Yeah, yeah actually, the uh, if I remember right, I just read that the... For the first time in God knows how long, the population of China has actually decreased. Yeah, yeah which yeah, is actually which here. actually might yeah. might destroy the world economy. <laughs> so we yeah, got that uh, here, here's here's yeah. something here's something for people to put into perspective for the sheer number of people then that are and were in China at yeah. the time. The fact that twenty years after, or so well, this is in 1980. Given how many years after. Uh, about the, multiple 40, world wars yeah, 40, yeah yeah 
with there having been a couple of world wars within the previous 80 years yeah. along with that war along with everything else they still had too many people <laughs> there's a lot of so, people but yeah but china's a big place so you could spread out no, no, it's it's, china's it's gigantic. huge like yeah china's but gigantic. yeah um but anyway Yes, Chinese outnumber Japanese 10 to 1. And that is a theme that will continue as this story unfolds. The Japanese never have more people than the Chinese through this whole thing. It never happens. Now, even though the Chinese were far from the battle-hardened warriors that the Japanese were, were they fought hard. So they, they caused large losses for the Japanese military. So when the city eventually fell about three months later they thought they were going to walk into shanghai take it over be done boom out kind of like putin yeah, yeah. with ukraine he thought he'd walk in there take everything and be done within a week they thought the same thing it took them three months to completely take over shanghai uh it took several battles in several areas in and around shanghai so when they were done the japanese angry and ready for blood so, they then turned their focus to the, at the time, capital of the Republic of China, Nanking. So, the, I'll get into the preparation that the Chinese had for Nanking. Either next episode or the third episode, I haven't decided which. Uh, the, the Japanese strategy for Nanking was a fairly simple one. As simple as military plans go. The army exploited the fact that the city was blocked by water in two directions. I'll uh, post a map up on our Instagram so everybody can kind of see what Nanking looked like at the time. I actually, I actually just googled it. Did <laughs> I you? just wanted to have a look. See so you, yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to have a look at it. So yeah. Uh, so the cap, the capital lay uh, south of a bend in the Yangtze River. Uh, that first course northward and then turned to flow east. By converging upon Nanking in a semicircular front from the southeast, the Japanese could use the natural barrier of the river to complete the encirclement of the capital and cut off all escapes. Late in November, three parallel Japanese troops rushed towards Nanking. Now, I know for military, you know, this might be a little boring, but it, it, you, there's, there's stuff in here that is important, so bear with me. So one of these uh, groups or battalions, whatever you want to call them, traveled west under the southern bank of the river, then pouring into the Yangtze Delta through the Peimu Inlet northwest of Shanghai and along the Nanking Shanghai Railway. Uh, they were led by Nakajima Kesigo, a man that has been described as, quote, a beast and a violent man. Sounds like my kind of guy. Uh, yeah, he's going to be Hello. let loose, and it's not going to be fun for anybody. Now, it should be said, again, these are all Asian names, and we know my track record with Asian names. It's about as good as my track record with French names. So I apologize. <laughs> to, I don't apologize to the motherfuckers like these guys whose names I, I brutalize, but to the entire you know Japanese and Chinese <laughs> nations. I, I actually... <laughs> I didn't want to mention it before, but I was about to say to you that the um, when we were covering uh, the stuff that was in the, in <laughs> remember you were, you couldn't pronounce Leicester, and I told you how to pronounce it. Uh -huh. There was there were, there were many other towns that um, I chose to not not correct you on because I thought it was funny. <laughs> but, yeah. Sure, there basically were. anywhere that yeah anything that you said ending in Shire, basically. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I just uh, oh, I thought it was awfully funny. I, I'm. It's like, it's like even the English can't escape, no. <laughs> can't escape Kevin's issues nope. with, name, with names. No, nope. if you have a name that's spelled where uh, like, there's one person we'll cover in the next episode. Uh, she's like, this is the most Chinese name ever. I have no idea how to pronounce it. It's got an X, a Y, a Z, and a G in it. I don't know how to pronounce those well, fucking they, names. They're, yeah, they're probably all pronounced with a Z. Yeah. Like, Z. Uh, so anyway, as, uh, as long as there isn't a general Worcestershire, then it'd be all right. That's 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 <laughs> like the best joke is you go up to your wife and you go, "Sweetie, I, I don't know how to say this." Worcestershire, Worcestershire, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, fuck, we gotta have fun sometime because the rest of this shit's gonna be depressing as hell. All right, so a second force yep. readied itself for a bold amphibious assault across Taihu, a lake situated halfway between Shanghai and Nanking. Uh, they moved 
uh, west from Shanghai in a route south of Nakajima's troops. Now, they were led by General Matsui Iwani, commander-in-chief of the Japanese army for the region. It's the name you need to remember here for a little bit. He was small, frail, and suffered from a bout of tuberculosis. He's not very good for military, then, is he? You wouldn't think. Uh, oh, he's going around with TB, <laughs> coughing and spluttering. That's what they do. Chemical warfare practice or whatever. Like, they throw him into the middle of the troops. And, <laughs> I believe back then they, All over the place. Probably, they might have still called it consumption back then. I don't know. The third group traveled further south of Matsui's men and swerved northwest towards Nanking, led by Lieutenant General Yanagua Hesuki, a man that will be all but forgotten to history. We won't really hear more about him, so I don't have to pronounce his name anymore, which is great. Uh, Now, it should be noted, maybe not noted, but acknowledged, that Nanking was not the only city to be decimated by the Japanese. The army decided to get some of their aggression out on the way to Nanking as well. They raided tiny farm communities where everyone in sight was clubbed and or bayoneted and razed entire cities to the ground. Uh, like the city of Sachao, uh, now known as Zuhu. Uh, China is one of those places where every time they have a regime change, they change the name of half the fucking towns. It, yeah, yeah. You know, whatever. Uh, now, this is on the east bank of the Taihu Lake. Uh, it's one of the oldest cities in China. It's known as the Venice of China because of all the architecture and art. And, and uh, just apparently it used, at least at one point, was a lovely place. But on Ooh. the 19th of November, 1937, the Japanese advanced in the rain through the gates of the city. Now, it should be mentioned that many of the more prevalent cities in China are surrounded by walls and gates. The Chinese have a thing for walls, if you didn't know. It's kind of what they're famous yeah. for. Yeah, they have a very big thing about <laughs> <Yeah>. walls. <laughs> yeah. The army moved in with their hoods up to prevent the Chinese sentries from recognizing them. Now, once inside, the Japanese murdered and plundered the city for days burning down ancient landmarks and abducting abducting thousands of Chinese women for sexual sa- slavery. Let's just say real quick, the whole sexual slavery thing will be a continual theme and problem as this series goes on. Wish I could do something about it. I can't. I'm sorry. It's just that's how it happened. I can't change things. Uh, it's not your fault. It's not my fault. Thank you. I needed to hear it's that. those Japanese people. I, I needed to hear that. Because sometimes when I was writing this, I was like, nobody's going to like me after I tell them this stuff. See, if, if this was a piece of fiction, like, I've read pieces of fiction before where you turn around and you literally think to yourself, like, fuck you, the <laughs> author. Because what they do, this, this isn't a piece of fiction, though. It's not as if... No, this really happened. You know, you've yeah. written... Yeah, exactly, yeah. But you still feel bad. Uh, so according to the China Weekly Review, the population of Chuck. Suchow, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong, uh, went from around 350,000 to less than 500. Whoa. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Holy. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's a, that's a big drop. That's a big yeah. drop. Uh, then there's Sung Chang, a suburb of Shanghai on the Pine River, which a British correspondent witnessed about nine weeks after after the Japanese went through, quote, there is hardly a building standing which has not been gutted by fire. Smoldering ruins and deserted streets present an eerie spectacle, the only living creatures being dogs unnaturally fattened by feasting on corpses. In the whole of Sung Chang, which should contain a densely packed population of approximately 100,000, I saw only five Chinese who were old men hiding in a French mission compound in tears. That sounds lovely. (laughs) No. Lord. Obviously, this was six weeks after the fact. Chinese knew that a lot of this stuff was going to happen eventually. So many of the population of each of these cities probably fled before the invasion. And many probably during or after. So it's doubtful that they murdered 345,500 and 99,995 people, respectively. Uh, But it would be foolish to think that a large amount of people didn't stick around, stubborn, proud, ready to fight. In some cases, like we'll find in Nanking, 
hopeful that the Japanese will bring a better life than what they had under the tutelage of the Chinese government, which is to be massacred by the invading army. Uh, which, yeah, there, you can see that there's people that are like, oh, yay, the Japanese are coming. This will be fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, you know, all for it. Rare to go. Yeah. Uh, it's the same bitch. They wish they built the wall on the other side of the country now. <laughs> Yeah, they built one on this side, you forgot the other yeah. fucking side. And they're like, oh, well, we have the water. Well, <laughs> yeah, boats, you know, yeah. they've been around yeah. for eons. Uh, so the most notorious of the events that took place in the lead up to the occupation of Nanking, again, we're not even there yet. We're not to the horribleness yet. This is all just semantics. Uh, was the almost mandatory killing contest Japanese soldiers were made to participate in. The most famous of which was the competition between Mukai Tashiyaki and Noda Takashi. Again, horrible with Asian names. I'm perfectly fine with them when I'm saying them to myself, reading them on my phone, just trying to read through. I'm like, oh, that's how you pronounce yeah. it. And then, I, and then my mouth says, fuck off, I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this this competition was actually covered by the Japan advisor like a sports contest. They had, like, updates on it as they went along. People could follow. Like, people could like, get like, this. Like, Go ahead. It's like, I was going to say, it's like Mortal Kombat or something like that. Like, you know, the guys are just people reporting could, on it the whole time. People could follow along at home from the newspaper and see how well they were doing in their killing contest, how many Chinese people they <laughs> decapitated. So the article goes as follows. Sub-Lieutenant Mukai Toshiaki and Sub-Lieutenant Noda Takashi, both of the Katagiri unit in Kuyung, in a friendly contest to see which of them will first fell 100 Chinese in individual sword combat before the Japanese forces completely occupy Nanking are well in the final phase of their race, running almost neck to neck, which I find is bad fucking taste to say neck yeah, to yeah. neck. I was just thinking, <laughs> I was just thinking is he going to say neck to neck? I uh, read that the first time I went, oh, come on. that, And I even said it to my wife. She's like, well, I wouldn't put it that way if I was you. I was like, it wasn't me. It's the fucking newspaper. They put yeah. it that way. <laughs> on Sunday, December, again, this is still the article. On Sunday, December 5th, the score awaiting to, the score according to Asai, which I don't know who the fuck that is, they don't tell me, was Sub-Lieutenant Mukai, 89, and Sub-Lieutenant Noda, 78. A week later, the paper reported that neither man could decide who passed the 100 mark first, so they upped the goal to 150. Quote, oh, of course yeah. Yeah. Mukai's blade was slightly damaged in the competition. He explained that this was the result of cutting a Chinese in half, helmet and all. When asked how he felt about the contest, Mukai said it was, quote, fun. That's, that's <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but that is the, the biggest kind of like dick measuring thing I've ever heard in my life. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, totally cut that guy right in half, helmet and everything. <laughs> it's like, it's uh, yeah, right. Come cut on. him in half? Yeah, you know, crown to toe, not, not crosswise. Yeah. I terrified, you know, terrified. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, nah, that's I, I don't believe a word of it, not in the slightest. Well, maybe I, mean, I believe that they're they're killing all these people. I don't know if he cut cut them from from crown to crotch or not, but <laughs> I believe the rest of it. Uh, so again, before we get to Nanking, we're not even there yet. Uh, it needs to be noted that there was sort of a uh, power change in the upper echelon of the Japanese military. Now, while Matsui had been in charge of pretty much everything in the region up until early December, given his assignment by the Emperor Showa, or, as oh. many of us know him, Emperor oh. Hirohito, uh, he was, Matsui was older, and like I had said earlier, sick from tuberculosis. Now, this is a possibility that these things played a factor in Hiro Hirohito's appointing his own uncle, Prince Asaka Hasuhuku, which I'm not going to say his name anymore. Fuck that. 
<laughs> I was looking forward to all of these names. I know you are. <laughs> uh, the worst thing is you can't even shorten them or come up with some nickname version without coming across as being a big racist. Yeah. So. So anyway, the what was his first name? Uh, or what Asaka. What was his first name? Prince. <laughs> we'll we'll just call him yeah. the Prince. The yeah. Prince. Sure. Um. So the Prince was supposed to be a replacement for Matsui, and Matsui was getting a quote promotion out of combat. Uh, this is probably the most important event to lead up to what was to come. Matsui, while he was still in power over the region, issued a set of moral commandments for the invasion of Nanking. He ordered his armies to regroup a few kilometers outside the city walls to enter the capital with only a few well-disciplined battalions and to complete the occupation so that the army would, quote, sparkle before the eyes of the Chinese and make them place confidence in Japan. He he was all, we should overtake them almost with love. We want them to want us there. Right. So basically, short version here now, so Japanese walk into Shanghai, destroy the place, take it over after three months, and then they start roaming through the rest of the country, going west slash northwest. Yeah towards Nanking, destroying everything mm-hmm. in their way. Yeah. Having it, making sport of it. And then this new guy steps in and he's like, well, the, Power of love. Well, Matsui was the guy who was in charge of the whole thing to begin with. Um, yeah. And he oh, was right, the one right, who right, wanted sorry. them. Yeah. Him yeah, he wanted them to, he, but, but how you treat Shanghai, even though it was technically the New York City of, of China, and how you treat all the smaller places, this would be like walking into, you know, this is the capital. Of the entire country. If, if you could just walk into there, peaceful, take it over as quickly as possible, um, without yeah. hurting anybody, there's a good chance that you'll be able to work something out, get what you need, everything could be over pretty soon. Uh, in a meeting with the staff officers, uh, while Matsui was in his sickbed, he said, quote, The entry of the Imperial Army into the foreign capital is a great event in our history, attracting the attention of the world. Therefore, let no unit enter the city in a disorderly fashion. Let them know beforehand the matters to be remembered and the position of foreign rights and interests to the walled city, in the walled city. Let them be absolutely free from plunder. Dispose sentries as needed. Plundering and causing fires, even carelessly, shall be punished severely. Together with the troops, let many military police and auxiliary military police enter the walled city and thereby prevent unlawful conduct so yeah if if there's centuries if there's people like protecting the city obviously you know kill them but don't go in there you know just haphazardly and just start taking people out you know well, sounds like nobody got that memo <laughs> well so. problem was matsui was promoted out of action just a couple days later and then the prince left Tokyo by plane, arrived on the front around the 8th of December, just one day after becoming the new commander-in-chief of the region. So about One day before my birthday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so now you have something else to... Ah, <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> uh, so about 10 miles southeast of Nanking, he met the general... Nakajima and other colleagues that they uh, had served with over in France. Um, fun fact: Nakajima was actually recovering from a flesh wound in his left ass cheek at the time. I don't know why that was in the book. It plays. It does not play another part. It'd be like maybe that's why he was all surly and killing people because he had a wound in his in his ass. But there's no other part of the book that, that has anything to do with. It's just a fun fact. He's got a he's got a hole in his ass cheek. <laughs> the guy sat down in a thumbtack and went to all hell basically <laughs> on the entire city. Oh, he sat on his bayonet wrong. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, the prince. That's funny. <laughs> the prince was told uh, that the army was surrounding about three hundred thousand Chinese troops in and around Nanking, and it looked as if they were ready to surrender. So seems perfect. You know, you're going to yeah. the capital. Everybody's ready to just give up, give you what you want. 
So the prince sent out a set of orders under his personal seal, marked secret to be destroyed, and the mission the message simply said, Kill all captives. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> Yeah. The like opposite way of how uh Matsui wanted to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just yeah. <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> Again, it's just ridiculous. Like, <laughs> again, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> so, oh, so here was the plan. The plan was to gather up all the POWs and separate them into three groups. Take 50 or so from each group to separate areas, mow them down with machine guns, rinse and repeat for about two and a half hours till they're all dead. That, you know, boom, yeah. simple, clean. Uh, why kill all the captives? Well, there's a few... Uh, varying reasons um but it all comes down to the fact that if you have prisoners you also have to in turn take care of said prisoners you have to feed them give them housing medical attention all that good shit uh plus if you have no prisoners there's no possibility of retaliation and that that's they, that's true yeah the, yeah. Ja- the japanese again they were massively outnumbered massively outnumbered by <laughs> troops yeah, yeah. and by civilians you'll see here in a minute um so it, it, every time I think I, I read this part or think about this part, um, it reminds me you, you've seen a bug's life, the movie A Bug's Life. Yep. How the grass yeah, yep. the grasshoppers are like, if those ants realize that they outnumber us two hundred to one, we're done for. It's the exact yeah, yep. same thing. If the Chinese realize, hey, all we gotta do, well, a lot of us are gonna die, but we could fight back. They realize that the Japanese were done for. Yeah, it's just using fear as the uh, exactly. It's the method. Exactly, bunch of assholes. <laughs> so I, I, I saw I saw a place here now. If um if I was to ever live in China, I'd have to start um a bloodhound gang tribute band because and base it out of a town that I just found here called Bing Fang Gang. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Bing Christ. Fang Gang. Jesus Christ. Okay. So the Japanese had a plan, all right, but executing executing it was a different story. So when the Japanese finally broke through the walls of Nanking on December 13th, after a long campaign of aerial bombardment, the 50,000 troop strong army was met with about half a million civilians and 90,000 Chinese troops. So, yeah. Nice. <laughs> almost almost 600,000 against 50,000. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To the Japanese fortune, however, many of the Chinese had thrown away their weapons when they tried to flee the city during the siege, which, again, we will talk about tomorrow. Well, not not tomorrow. Next episode. I'm sorry. I wish it was tomorrow. I want to get this fucking thing done and over with. So ra- That's because they were uh, cheap Chinese copies of things, you see, because they haven't got the copyright issues there, you know. So always buy American people. Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like little packages. They're not X Men. They're like action person. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> love those. <laughs> so rounding up the thousands of troops wasn't as difficult as they thought it would be because the troops didn't have any fucking weapons. Uh, like when some Chinese guards, again, the, the, the Japanese are walking around in groups of like ten or twelve. Uh, they come across in the middle of the night this field that just all of a sudden lights up with cigarette butts and the sounds of frogs and they shine their light on them. And there's about 7,000 Chinese troops just in a field waving two white makeshift flags. Like, Hey, we give up. So these handful of Japanese troops took 7,000 Chinese soldiers captive. Jesus. Yeah. I must have, I must have borrowed those uh, white flags from the French. <laughs> you know, I, the French get a lot of shit, but if you ever watch the riots in France, they will riot over fucking anything. They're worse than we oh, are know. with riots. Like they wanted to, they wanted to up the retirement age by two years, and like they were burning houses down. It's fucking, oh, Jesus. fucking ridiculous. <laughs> uh, so. The Chinese willingly gave themselves up to the handful of Japanese. Uh, They were taken to a large abandoned house in a village near Nanking. And the next day, they were separated into two or 
uh, into groups of two or three hundred and killed. It's so simple. Oh, yeah. They were told. Was, do, yeah. They they told them like, listen, we're gonna get you food, we're gonna get you water, we're gonna get you medical attention. It's gonna be great. Let's go out to this house. A lot of the Chinese troops actually felt like this is gonna be the end. They're gonna kill us when they got to the house. They they, they said that it looked like a slaughterhouse. Um, but again, nobody fought back. So the next day, they just yeah. they just killed them all. Yeah, yeah. Easy, easy peasy. It's, like, it's pretty horrible. It is. So th- that you know, 7,000 is bad, but that pales in comparison to the massacre at Mufu Mountain on the 16th of December. 14,777 Chinese soldiers were captured, stripped of everything but their clothes, and taken to temporary buildings. Next day, the Chinese... Where did, tri- that, where did that happen? Mufu Mountain. I just wanted to hear you say it again. <laughs> the next day, the Chinese troops were told that they would be moved to an island for holding, but in order to do so, they had to have their hands bound behind their backs for safety. Uh, the process oh. took hours, and they just let them. They just they let me tie I your hands. See where your this hand. is going. I can see where this is going already. <laughs> like, God damn it. So then between 4 and 6 p.m., the troops were divided and marched to the riverbank. Uh, And then they stood there for about four hours after the sun had gone down. Then the Japanese opened fire with machine guns. Uh, Chinese had nowhere to run. The machine guns were behind them, uh, shot at them. If they run forward, they're going into an icy river. With their hands tied behind their their backs. With their hands tied behind their backs. Uh, the gunfire lasted about an hour. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And then, just, you know, to make sure, the Japanese spent the rest of the evening and some of the next morning bayonetting the bodies one by one. Well, uh, yeah, of course they did. Yeah. Can't leave anybody of behind. Of course they did. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, double tap. The number one rule of zombie apocalypse. Double tap. That's what you gotta do. Uh we might get to the kill of the week. I don't know. But yeah, double that. Uh, so the problem with killing so many, what do you do with all the bodies? You can't just you know, let them sit there. Um, there weren't enough large ditches for the groups of seven to 8,000 corpses. And when they decided to try cremation and the Japanese poured large drums of gasoline on mounds of bodies to burn them, the drums ran out of fuel before the fire could do the job. Quote, the result was a mountain of charred corpses, uh, which the war dogs that the Japanese had and the you know various animals around the area just came and just started eating off of. Sounds delicious. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's, I was going to say I did not have enough dogs to feed them. I'm assuming man. It was, I'm assuming Woohoo Mountain Two was built from the corpses. Then, <laughs> just, just so you got you got big Mufu Mountain and then little Mufu Mountain next to it. Like you yeah. just kind of put the bodies up to make it look like that. Take a picture. Uh, but what happened? So this is all horrible. What happened to the Chinese troops after the Jap- Japanese entered the cities? It's all absolutely horrible. But it's not what makes the rape of Nan King. The rape of Nan King. That's what happened to the five hundred thousand civilians, which is again, you know, a war crime. <laughs> but yeah, well, any kind of crime. But yeah, I, that's, I, that's, I don't think the that's... Japanese went and signed the Geneva Convention. I think they probably just do whatever they want. Um, well, that's it. So before the Japanese entered the city, the citizens of Nan King had the hope that the invading army would treat them well. That. Hopefully, when the fighting was over, the Japanese would return to civility and may even possibly be better rulers than the government that they had had, the one that had abandoned them. Um, you come to find out that the the government in Nanking pretty much just took off and left the troops and the people to fend for themselves. Honestly. That's pretty typical. <laughs> pretty terrible yeah. rulers all across history. So many... Yeah. Many of the Chinese actually came out to welcome their new occupiers, uh, cheering as they entered through the walls, hanging the Japanese flag from their windows at home and at work. But when the Japanese troops entered the city, they didn't do so with good intentions. They did so with machine guns, 
revolvers and rifles, shooting anyone they saw. Uh, they They would occupy government buildings, banks, warehouses, shooting random people, many of them in the back as they ran away, uh, firing into crowds of scared people, taking out elderly women, children, anyone they saw. Soon, uh, every section of the city had bodies in the streets and alleys, either dead or dying. Many of the streets literally ran red with blood, and that is a phrase that will be used more than once in this series. There's a lot of streets and rivers and ponds that turn into just streams of blood. It's, yeah, 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 I can imagine. It's, don't then, even know what to say. <laughs> about it, like, there's you know? nothing you can't say. Again, anytime. Yeah, like, yeah, like, so we, I know looking at the map, like you know, it's not as big, it's bigger now, obviously, than it would have been back then. Right? You can see, realistically, you kind of see if, if anybody was to map it, like I mean, what would have been being the city back then yeah you know um i'm just trying to think like you know what I mean? just imagine the whole place is, yeah it's it's a war it's it's literally just a war zone and only one yeah. side has guns <laughs> it was just horrible um so j- just to let people know now we we had discussed before that um I-, I listened to a podcast about this before they had a really good idea that when shit gets too heavy Maybe they stop and give out a little fun fact or an anecdote or something. Kind of a palate cleanser. So at any moment, um, if Dan's feeling like, eh, maybe things are getting a little too heavy, I'm going to leave it up to him. Uh, if things are getting a little too heavy, we're going to throw some fun facts in there just to kind of brighten everything up, give everybody a good smile before we get back to the horribleness. So, Dan, whenever, whenever you feel the need, just say, well, here, fun fact. I'll give you a little example All of right. a fun fact here so people know exactly what to expect. Um, it is illegal to own a guinea pig in Switzerland because I... it's considered animal abuse, animal abuse as they are social beings and they get lonely. I saw the same thing. Apparently, if you're going to own a guinea pig, you have to own two. That's... I, I like that, though. Yeah. You know, it's a good good little fact. And hopefully, when I said the word guinea pig, most people went, oh. Yeah, now let's it. get back to the brutal murder guinea, guinea of all these Chinese people. I love guinea pigs. Yeah. So the yeah. troops then went house to house searching for Chinese soldiers that were hiding out, uh, killing as they went along. They also went to the smaller suburbs and countryside villages and homes near the city. They started piling up corpses outside the city walls uh, along the river, which, again, literally ran red with blood. Uh, they stalked them by ponds, lakes, hills, mountains, shooting any young man that passed by, assuming they may have once been a Chinese soldier, uh, plus others that didn't follow orders, mainly because they couldn't understand them because they didn't speak Japanese. They're, <laughs> they're, telling, them, they're telling them what to do in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> they're not the same fucking language. Uh, even, even Asian people think all Asian people are all Asian people. <laughs> So he must speak the same language as me. <laughs> look up, uh, look up, um, Bobby, uh, Bobby, is it Bobby Lee? Used to be on uh, Mad TV. He's got a great bit about how all, how about even Asian people think Asian people look alike. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's funny. I'm not going to tell it because it'd be racist coming from me, but I'll let, you know, he can say it. So look him up. It's funny. Um, they would raid stores, murdering everyone inside, looting what they wanted and burning the rest. One Japanese reporter claimed she watched Chinese prisoners being lined up on top of the walls and soldiers charging at them with bayonets, causing the prisoners to fall anywhere from 46 to 67 feet to the ground, splattering blood everywhere. Also delightful. Yeah. Like yeah these, hands grubering people. Pretty much. Yeah, these walls that were around the city weren't like 20-foot high walls that you could climb up with a ladder. These were these are city walls. They're fucking huge and thick. Well, if they didn't if they didn't shout happy trails hans in Japanese every single time, I'd be bitterly disappointed. Jesus though. Christ. So <laughs> mountains of bodies were thrown into the Yangtze River by civilians at gunpoint. Uh, Many of the bodies were still alive until the freezing water took them under and they drowned. Now, by the time they were all done, the pier, some people were like, man, look at all the mud on the pier. But it wasn't mud. It was glistening with blood. 
the entire pier was covered in blood. So much that it looked like just mud all over the pier. Yeah, uh, yeah. So after the prisoners, <laughs> well, you, you have a hard time thinking what to say. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it's just it's like Jesus. <laughs> it's 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 like taking like Hostel, the movie times fifty in a yeah. single room, you know, yeah. and spreading that across an entire city. Yeah, yeah. But remember the the theme for this show, uh, for this episode, for the series. Uh, it's only going to get worse. Well, yeah. Things so after, only after, get after, worse. <laughs> after, that's why I have uh, from the good place as my background today. Uh, welcome. Everything is fine. You ever seen the good place? <laughs> uh, With Kristen sure Bell and uh, Ted Danson. It's one of the best uh, shows. Probably. It's one of the best shows ever made. It's oh. fantastic. Love it. Go watch the good place. It's great. Uh, it'll make you feel a lot better. Um, after what I'm going to tell you now. So after the prisoners did their job about, you know, dragging bodies into the river, they were lined up against the river bank and shot. So, you know, uh, this their hard work and effort. Exactly. This event alone, an estimated 20,000 people were killed. Jesus. Uh, the river literally backed up with bodies. Uh, a pond nearby turned completely red from the killings that went on over there so and it's safe damn but that'd be a bit of a double entendre yeah damn the body yeah the beavers had a heyday yeah. with it damn uh yeah a, a journalist said she wished she would have had a color uh camera to take a photo of the lake because like that would have been a hell of a picture because the lake was red yeah the pond yeah. was completely yeah. red now so not all the imagine. chinese <sighs> just gave in uh there were more than a few men that would lay buried under rows of corpses for days before climbing their way out and dragging their bullet ridden bodies to the hospital or clinging to reeds in the icy yangtze river for hours hiding in holes or ditches sometimes for weeks and hiding was the best thing to do especially when the japanese began more killing contests so literally a game to see which soldier could kill the most chinese like we had already talked about and they kept score by collecting heads uh chinese men and women were set up in lines next to trenches lambs to the slaughter as japanese troops walked to each of their to each with their sword cut off their head leaving the corpse to fall back and then on to the next so these killings so, oh, sorry they they kept count by the amount of heads they collected. So they would they would like, they would go in multiple rows, and then groups of two right. soldiers would walk along these rows. Cut off the one person would cut off the head, the other person would grab the head, throw it into a pile, and each pile went along with each per, with each set of troops. So you you could keep count of how many. Ah, uh, right, yeah. Well, I was thinking yeah. more on the personal side thing. So like the other guys having their little one hundred and fifty killing spree thing and yeah yeah, it's, it, yeah it was I, a different, I just had this yeah. image of this guy dragging this fucking massive bag <laughs> behind him you know no no it was, it was just like, going ah oh, chop off yeah. an ear or no no it was like it was like to... uh little pickup games of basketball or something and be like hey let's go yeah. have a killing contest real quick let's see which one of us can kill the most um after a while they started getting tired they just started slashing throats and keeping count but yeah for the most part yeah they would just they they set up a line start cutting off heads see who can get through the most the fastest these these games with people <laughs> could uh, say, sorry, th thank God they invented the fucking Nintendo later on to keep them entertained. Because <laughs> my good God, like, these uh, these killing sprees in games could last up to an hour. Yeah. So, um, and then the scavenging of war dogs, mostly German shepherds, would go to town on the corpses, just fatten them themselves up. They didn't even feed yeah. the, the German shepherds or the whatever they brought. They just let the dogs eat the corpses. That's what they... That's well, what yeah, they sure, yeah. yeah. You're, you're just a steady supply do. of food yeah. all the time, yeah. That's just... Yeah. yeah. But see, death is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, quick decapitation may be the most humane thing the Japanese did during the infamous six weeks of horror while in Nanking. So let's get to what this show is famous for and start talking about the tortures the Chinese endured. 
I haven't even hit the hardship. Well, I have, yeah, we haven't gotten to torture yet. All these people so far just need either shot or, you know. Well, here's a quick off. trivia thing for you then, for people to think about real quick before the end of all the press. All right. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of weird when I read it. Which, which U.S. state do you think is the closest to Africa? Without looking at a map. You know? Oh, um, it's... Isn't it like Maine or some shit like that? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Is Maine, yeah, yeah. I heard Which that I before. Thought, it's because of how yeah, because of how the so world far east. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was weird, and I had to map it. Then. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> You're like, no, that can't be true. That's yeah, that's ridiculous. But, uh, here's a, Massachusetts looks like it sticks out a little bit further, but it's because of the curvature of the earth. Yeah. Here's another uh, fun little mm-hmm. fact that might make you chuckle. The guy who invented Match. dot com. His mm-hmm. wife, he lost his wife to a man she met on Match.com. Oh, my God. That is amazing. That reminds me of a uh, – I was thinking about that. It reminds me of a story of a guy I used to work with. For months, he begged and begged and begged his wife for a threesome with this other chick that he knew. She's like, I'm I'm bisexual. I've met your wife. She's hot. I want – you know, I would love to. Let me know if you ever want to. So he's begging and begging and begging his wife for a threesome. Finally, she caves in. They have the threesome. About three or four months later, he's moving out, and the girl, and the woman they had a threesome with, is moving in. Nice. <laughs> it's like, dude, you fucking idiot. That's just, oh, oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> so groups of Chinese would actually dig graves. Uh, then they would be forced to lay down in them. Then a second group would bury them alive, and then they would dig grave. And then they would lay down in them, and a third group would bury them, and so on and so on until they ran out of people to bury alive. Yeah, which, right. Okay. Which is one of the biggest horrors <laughs> that, that I, I that is that is a genuine fear of being buried alive. I'm not very claustrophobic, but being buried alive is a genuine fear. Yeah, so that's where the whole wasn't a dead ringer thing comes from is because of the amount of people that were buried alive at one stage before medical things you can tell like so you can end up in a state where your heart rate's so slow that people think you're dead or whatever apparently people were buried alive so what they yeah. allegedly what they used to do was tie a string around a person's finger or hand mm-hmm. so was that it was tied to a bell yeah and their grave hence yeah there's a there. you can you look online you can find old like catalogs or something that actually have different types you can buy for your grave just to make oh, sure yeah yeah well, I, I ain't getting buried, but I want a bell attached to whatever the hell I have my ashes in. <laughs> just put it around. Just for the crack. The just, yeah, yeah, just in case my little ashy hand decides to go. Dee, dee, dee. <laughs> <laughs> if you hear that bell ring in, then you know then that ghosts are real. And I've got <sighs> to haunt everybody. <laughs> so some would be buried up to their waist or chest or neck and then be beaten, hacked to pieces with swords, shot at, Ramsey Boltoned, attacked by dogs, or mm-hmm. ran over by horses or tanks. Uh, they oh. would. <laughs> what well, Jesus? I'm sorry. I'd rather to tank over anything else. I think because I think it'd be pretty instant. Yeah, I think it'd be pretty. Like, it'd yeah, be pretty quick. instantaneous. Like, unless, you know, but unless, it sounds the worst. <laughs> unless they get like half of you. Like you got like you're up to your chest or something. They just just roll over your shoulder yeah, or something. Or, or yeah, God. or you're in like you know really what? soft Honestly, ground. And you just get pushed under a little bit. <laughs> the best one would just be shot at. Just shoot me in the fucking head. Get it over with. Jesus Christ. Uh, they would yeah, be sure disemboweled and dismembered while still alive. Some were nailed to wooden boards, crucified to trees or electrical posts. Uh, Dan, a bit of your favorite, some Ling Chi would happen because they cut off long strips of flesh as they hung oh. from wherever they were at. Uh, sometimes first kebab. Yep. Sometimes, sometimes those who were crucified were also used as bayonet practice. At least a hundred. Oh, yeah, that's, that's understandable. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard. I've heard. I've seen that happening in in other scenarios as well. All right, like yeah, where you have to basically take them and use them as practice for charging and yeah, with bayonets oh, and stuff like that. Like when yeah, we, they, I think there was a Japanese to that not a lot more War Two, didn't they? Yeah. Well, when so, we get when we get into the history of what happened up until this point, um, mm-hmm. we will get more into the bayonet practicing on Chinese people because they do it quite a bit. Uh, at least a hundred. Uh, Chinese had their eyes gouged out, their noses and ears hacked off before, before being set on fire. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you can't see the fire coming, you can't hear the people screaming, and you can't smell yourself burning. 
because all that stuff mm. is gone. Uh, a group of 200 soldiers and civilians were stripped naked, tied to columns and doors of a school, and then were stabbed by Suezy. Now, these are special needles with handles on them, and they were stabbed in hundreds of points along their body, including mouths, throats, and eyes. Yeah, pretty much just like extreme acupuncture and everywhere you don't want it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, captive. That, that's, were... yeah. I <laughs> just imagine just having these mental images. <laughs> like, like, yeah. Just like just a human porcupine basically walking around with stuff sticking out their face and shit. Like pinhead or something. Ooh, yeah. So captives were bound together ten at a time and pushed into a pit, sprayed with gasoline, and then ignited. And then others would be bound together and thrown on top of the fire. Uh, groups of Chinese would be driven to the tops of tall buildings, and then the stairs would be torn away and the building would be set on fire. Uh, some of these buildings were extremely tall. So Nanking was not just some mid-sized Asian village. Nanking is, depending on what statistic you look at, in the top 20 largest cities in the world by area. It's filled with very tall buildings. So when these buildings were set ablaze, there wasn't much captives could do to save themselves. Because when I went into the Rape of Nanking, I'm thinking this like smaller town that's just packed with people. It's, no, it was the capital. It was fucking Nanking, which is now called Nanjing. They changed the K to a J. Um, it's gigantic. It's a gigantic yeah. city. Yeah, I, I, I had that same image in my head. I don't know why I had this image in my head when you first told me about it, that it was just like a small a city. hundred years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I had this like kind of thing in my head as if it was like back in the kind of, I say, like samurai era of Japan. Right. They evade China or whatever. And it, like I knew that super basic element of it. That, that, but, and I just had, yeah, I had this thought in my head that it was like one of these small towns and it was like a few hundred people uh -huh. even at that like it's, it's fucking horrific like you know but yeah well because when you're talking about I realize what it was like oh my god <laughs> like, well when you're Jesus. talking about like bodies everywhere the entire city is covered in dead bodies and blood the, the first thing you think of is well it's got to be a small city because you can't cover a, a metropolitan area completely yeah. in dead bodies but no the japanese found a way they found yeah. a way it's 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 pretty damn big i'd say I'm, I'm trying to see what size it is kind of roughly in square kilometers but yeah at the moment i think but. i think the city proper if you look it up was like 14th in the world or something 2018 obviously this has changed between now and, and 1937 but still yeah yeah so they would douse hundreds of women and children uh in a square with gasoline and then blast them with machine guns to see uh, which ones would explode in the flames. Uh, now, ah, yeah, again, that's where Duck Hunt came yeah, from. Yeah, obviously. they're just they're honestly they're just doing whatever they can to Dear entertain Lord. themselves. So now it's to re be remembered that this took place in December, January, February in China. All right, it's fucking cold, like freezing cold. Prisoners yeah. were forced to strip naked, break the ice on nearby ponds, and jump in. And when their bodies eventually froze and floated to the top, they'd be used as target practice. Or they'd force them into freezing shallow ponds and then chuck grenades at them and watch the layer of ice turn red with blood and viscera. This is... <laughs> Uh, war dogs, again, the German shepherds, would be set upon victims, uh, genitals bitten away, bellies ripped open, intestines jerked away and dragged through the dirt. Uh, people were saturated with caustic acid. Babies of all ages were bayoneted. People were hung by their tongues. I don't know how that would work, but... Sorry, who were hung by their tongues? <laughs> people, just people, people in general oh, people. were hung by their tongues. <laughs> I don't know how. My wife and I actually had a discussion about this. How would you hang somebody from their tongue? And she's like, well, you just tie it around. I was like, no, the tongue is super slippery. It's going to slide off. Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a thick muscle, I know. But yeah. like, even if you were to, let's say, drive a nail through it or something, I had somebody go, like, like, 
You'd have to Hell, go. It wouldn't support the weight, like no. It couldn't so, possibly support. There's there's two ways that I'm thinking that you'd hang somebody from their tongue, and that's either with a strong clamp on the tongue with something tied to the clamp, so that way might work, or something driven through the tongue at the very base of it, where it's thickest and meatiest. Thickest. Again, if you pick somebody up by their tongue off the ground, though, that tongue's just gonna rip. It's still just muscle. It will tear. So what I'm thinking is that. They would hang somebody from their tongue just high enough to where they're on their tippy toes. Ah, so they're so they have their own so weight. So yeah, they Sporting. they're still holding up their own weight, but eventually yeah. something's gonna give. Their legs are gonna give out, and their tongues are either gonna get ripped off or ripped apart. Uh, that's the type of conversation my wife and I have. <laughs> When I force <laughs> when I force her to listen to me talk about the most horrible things humans have ever done to one another, um, at least well, one. Here's a fun fact. Okay, go ahead. Because <laughs> it's tongue related. <laughs> Apparently, a blue whale's tongue can weigh as much as an elephant. Man, it's a big yeah. fucking tongue. At least one person had their heart and liver ripped out and eaten by a Japanese soldier. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that that kind of tracks. All right. Yeah. That's that's that's. That's child's play compared to everything else that's been happening so far. Well, uh, penises were cut off and sold to Japanese customers who believed that eating them would increase virility. Of course they did. <laughs> yeah, that's just an excuse right there. That's the lonely soldiers. They just want to eat it. Away dick. from home. That's all they, they just want yeah, to eat Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so long trenches that the Chinese had dug during the preparation for the invasion. Deep trenches that were used to stop tanks you know the tank would drive over it and the trench would give way and it would just kind of fall in it couldn't go any further um Mm -hmm. they went ahead and just filled all these trenches with bodies both dead and alive and they had enough bodies to throw in them to make it so the vehicles could actually drive over them easily yeah that's (laughs) mental images right there (laughs) but as bad (laughs) as bad as all that was and it was fucking horrible. Nobody in Nanking or the surrounding area would suffer as much as the women would. And that's where we will pick it up with the massive amount of sexual assault that the women of all ages had to endure. And we'll have a little history lesson of how this all came to be, why the Japanese soldiers acted the way they did. Uh, a little hint, the Americans may have had something to do with it. You know. Europeans didn't help you. Yeah. Uh, And that's all on the second episode of The Rape of Nanking. Yeah, next episode is going to be very difficult to get through. Uh, Again, I've read through it. I've read through it several times. I've had to type it all out several times, you know, go over it several times. It's still really fucking hard to get through. So we're going to load up on fun facts because we're going to fucking need them. So we'd like to thank the That's Not Good, a true crime podcast for starting off this episode. We'll have a link to them in our show notes. Uh, Please follow us on Instagram and all the other social medias at TorturePod. Email us, TorturePod at gmail.com. If there's anything you'd like for us to cover, if you have any comments, you want to tell us uh, we're doing good, tell us we're doing bad. Um, You can go to the Apple. I think Podchaser you can uh, to uh, rate and review. Five-star rating is... uh, Again, always appreciated. Wherever you're listening to this, wherever you listen to your podcast normally, you go ahead and follow, subscribe. Uh, you can head over to our YouTube page. I'm doing little snippets and excerpts from the shows where you can actually see our our faces and our uh, Dan's reactions to have this today. <laughs> yeah. Yes, kissy face. Uh, uh, once we get the Patreon going, uh, you'll get to see the full video. We've got the full video up there. Uh, if you'd like to donate to the show, you can go to either our link tree, which you can find on our socials, or you can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash torture pod, which can also be found on our link tree. Um, we're currently working on some really good merch for you guys. Uh, some hats, some shirts, some totes, some water bottles, all that good shit. And water bottle, that'd be cool. Yeah, I'm not going to post the stuff until everything's you know, ready to go. Still deciding on where to get it from. Uh, I have uh, a handful of different ones that we're we're looking at. Yep. Yeah, so that's the thing like we, like we talked about before is one thing I want to make sure of is that I know the bigger side of the listenership is across in the States, but at the same time, it's very expensive 
for say me to order anything from any of the yeah. US stores. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if we should, like I said too before, but possibly looking into also setting up a European one if the interest is there. But we need to again find out if the interest is there. Sure. Over time. Yeah. Well, I know a lot so, of the places I looked at ship overseas. The the prices obviously do go up um, for the overseas stuff, which I tried to mark them down for the overseas stuff as much as possible uh, mm-hmm. to make it so people you know on your side of the pond, as it says. Um, can can still purchase it even if, when i do mark it down it's still more expensive but i think it's the shipping more than anything that's the problem um, but look that's that's kind of what happens though you know yeah, yeah that's it is just the shipping is typically the big big kicker yeah for us like you know ordering a t-shirt from the states is a horrible horrible <laughs> thing to go through <laughs> so well we're also uh working on our patreon like i said um there's been some issues with patreon the past few weeks i've heard about uh people's audio not going up um accounts being not deleted but stuff going on with people's accounts money not going through and stuff so we're going to give them a little bit of time to get their shit together maybe a couple weeks if they still haven't then we might just run all of our uh, exclusive stuff through red circle and buy me a coffee uh if that's possible because the good thing about buy me a coffee is you can you can subscribe to a monthly thing or a yearly thing or you can just make a one-time donation you don't have to subscribe to anything so you know it's either or but that's pretty good yeah and i like my coffee (laughs) and And, uh, specifically for buying coffee but anyway yeah um so this is going to be a three-parter, and I'm hoping that we can get together again and record pretty quickly because what I'd like to do is put out an episode, um, you know, what we normally do, and then the next two weeks. So I don't want you guys to have to wait, you know, six weeks to finish a whole three-part series. It'll be boom, boom, boom each week. So the, so next week, um, when you would be, you know, from when this comes out, the next week would normally be our off week like to put second episode there and then the third episode of the week we normally would that way you guys aren't waiting so long to fill it it would make sense six weeks of horror for the show six weeks you have to wait but i'm not gonna do that i don't want to do that to you guys you know six weeks is a long time kind of, for that'd be kind of fun though so like, <laughs> that's a long that's a long time for one series <laughs> when you know you're just gonna yeah. hear just the most awful shit it's like you gotta wait two weeks to hear just the most awful shit <laughs> actually speaking of uh, hearing awful shit before we uh, sign off I have a little thing that can help you um, with your with your accents okay I'm always open yeah um, so if you want to try and speak in a Scottish accent oh. I've probably said this on this podcast already sure <laughs> but anyway if you want to speak in a Scottish accent if you say the word space ghettos in a stereotypical American accent, it sounds like you're saying Spice, Spice Girls. Girls. Space Ghettos. It's the best. Space Ghettos? Space Ghettos. <laughs> space Ghettos. <laughs> space hey guys, ghetto. you ever hear those Space Ghettos? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. There's, oh God, there's a handful of those that you could do. I think Liam Neeson was telling people how to say stuff to make yourself sound like Irish and shit. Oh, speaking of sounding Irish... Here's an interesting factoid for you, as we discovered the other day. So, um, my wife and I were watching a TV series. It's an Australian show called Glitch. It's a pretty decent show. It's up on Netflix here. Anyway, I don't know if it's on Netflix over in the States. Uh, but um, it, there's an Irish character in the first couple of seasons. He's throughout the entire thing, really. But um, there's an Irish actor that plays this guy. Yeah. And then there's episodes where it shows like these fl- the kind of scenes from further back when he's younger. And they get a non-Irish person to play this guy. Right? <laughs> and he's an Australian guy who plays him. Now, the accent is the worst <laughs> Irish accent I've ever heard in my life. It's like We don't get offended by people doing really crappy, stereotypical Irish accents. You enter yeah. a show and you have like, let's say Tom Cruise and Far and Away, look at the people, right? It's, it's horrific. But we don't take offense to those things. Um, we we were offended by this accent. Like, <laughs> right, we were really offended by this. It was so bad, right? That I, I had to Google the guy and I had to Google the worst Irish accents to see was he listed, and he wasn't listed. But in the list, then, and I had to look this up after the fact. 
is Matt Damon in The Great Wall. Oh, yeah. Apparently, his character is Irish, and I didn't know this. So I looked it up and looked up, and it, you can hear the slight twang that he's trying to do. He's supposed to be some Irish mercenary. Yeah. And it is so goddamn bad. You just made me think of it, though, when you brought up The Great Wall. I mean, you, but, oh, my God. you gotta go a long way to offend an Irishman. <laughs> I will try and find a video of this guy. If and I'll try and send it on to you if and it's just so bad. We might we that <laughs> might be a show that's on here. I don't know. I'll have to check and see. If it is, then uh, I'll I'll check it out and see what you're talking about. Uh yeah. it kinda reminds me when you talk about that kinda reminds me of uh, outlawing when we talked about uh Mick Jagger playing uh oh, yeah. <laughs> Australian. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. I lo- I loved those sort of <laughs> casting choices like i said and that episode where i mentioned the fact of um sean connery playing a spanish yeah. prince yeah in highlander, uh, highlander. <laughs> yeah and the swede playing the scot yeah. spanish prince fucking shit uh that's why i try not to do accents unless i'm just gonna go as horrible as possible with them because like uh, they never come Honestly, yeah, yeah. You, yeah lean into it yeah, yeah that's, I'm that's, lean into that's how it. horrible they are yeah. All right. All right. Anyway, that's all. Uh, uh, that's all I got. You got anything? Anything else you want to pearls of nah. wisdom to share? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think there's anything. Anything wise, anyway. I think it's wise. Yeah. Though. All right. I, all I can say is for the next episode, guys, hold on to your butts because it's not going to be fun. Uh, we'll try to make it as fun as possible, but you could only make you could only make massive rapes so much fun before. <laughs> It feels like you're uh, poking fun at people. So. Yeah, it's very hard to polish a turd. Yeah, that thing. All right, guys, that's all I got. Take care of yourselves, take care of one another, and we'll see you. Sayonara. <laughs>